Careers and employment are popular topics these days. For many people, the pandemic definitely has shifted how we think about employment, quality of life, and even work culture. Millions of people suddenly had the collective experience of having to either learn how to do work from home or change how they work in the office in what seemed like a moment's notice. For the first time, it seemed that we had a chance to reflect on both our personal and work priorities. And for many of us, we decided to go after them. It's almost like we're in the era of the great career change. And if that's the case, this week's guest, Kenzia Mecklemore, will probably stay busy for the foreseeable future. Kenzie is a career strategy coach who spent 16 years as a human resources professional. However, in the last eight, including being an expat, she has been using her experience to provide career advice for professionals at all levels in a variety of industries. In this episode, Kentia discusses how the American dream isn't always what it seems and what happened when she and her husband decided to figure out what comes after you achieve it. We also chat about her identity as a biracial woman and the occasionally humorous cultural assumptions that she has faced. And Kentia, ever the career coach, also provides helpful tips for those who are seeking to work overseas and gives a reality check on some of the potential obstacles. Kentia uses her insider knowledge on how companies run to help clients pursue their professional transitions. It definitely helps that Kentia has been through a few herself. Welcome to the Global Chatter. For the folks who are listening in, I always like to do a little quick like location check. So where in the world are you? Okay, so I'm in Kaohsiung, Taiwan, which is the second largest city in Taiwan, mm. and it is the most southern large city in Taiwan. How long have you been out there? So we moved here in 2016, so okay. six years. Oh, wow. yeah. yeah, it is 2022. I was like, wait, let me do the math. Okay. Yeah. So here's, here's, you know, I, this is really always every foundational question I have with a gut, um, when a guest comes in, cause I like to give people context about the people who are here. So where did you grow up? Like where you, uh, you have an American accent, although I found you can have a generic American accent and not be American, but where did you yes. grow up? So I am a Southern girl. <laughs> I, grew- <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I was Born in North Carolina. Oh, even uh, better. Raised, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Durham. Even that, and... y'all, for y'all who don't know, Durham is literally like the line is literally five minutes from where I'm sitting right now. So I'm I'm more than pumped when I get North Carolinians. Okay, go ahead. Yep. Duke Hospital <laughs> well, over here. <laughs> so, yeah. So I was born there. But then when I was, let's see, third grade, my mm-hmm. parents moved to Texas because my dad's from Texas. Mm-hmm. So. My mom's from North Carolina. We moved to Texas and I grew up in Texas, went to college in Texas. What part of Texas did you grow up in? So I grew up in Beaumont, Texas, which is east of uh, Houston. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of, it's a mixture because it's Texas, but then you have the Louisiana, you Mm. know, influence. So like with the... Creole and Cajun food, Zydeco, all of that. I think it's a good, a good spot to be in Texas, with the exception of the weather. The weather's <laughs> not always great. But, is it because it's, it's, yeah. is it hot and humid or is it dry or what's the? Girls, hot and humid. It's hot and humid. <laughs> in all honesty, it's like, it's like Taiwan. Like, <laughs> well, then you were rain. For it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Like when people said, Oh, you're moving to Taiwan. Will you be able to take the weather? I'm like, I grew up in the weather. It's the same as Southeast Texas. So, yeah. So tell me a little bit about the area. Was it, was it a diverse area? Was there a lot of different class, like different, I like to say class, clash of cultures, different types of people, or was it pretty monolithic? Um, in Beaumont, when I was growing up, there was, I would say, you know, 
it was pretty similar, I think, to most places. Like, you have the African-American community, the white community, and then, of course, Hispanics, Latinos. But then we also had a large community of Vietnamese. Mm. Um, so from my perspective, I always thought that was interesting because mm-hmm. I like to get to know other you know, people and cultures. I've always had an interest in that just because of my personal background being biracial. Um, so there was a little difference, but I would say it was pretty basic for America. No, but you know, what's really funny though, because I, I've, I've been through Texas some, not, not mm-hmm. as much, but, and I, I lived in New Mexico, right? So to the okay. West of the state of Texas. Mm-hmm. I mean, Your I think, brother lived there. well, I think it's funny because in some ways, though, it, I think it was common to you because it was your childhood. But the, do you know what I mean? Do, do you know what I mean? Though, like you're just yeah. It's, just, it's like people ask me what was it like growing up in Cameroon, and I'm like it. It, it just was normal because that's I, I didn't have an alternative, so you didn't really have an alternative. It's just what it is. True. But I'm sitting there thinking, okay, just in that example though, you gave like four different distinct groups where there are parts of America that True. barely have just two of those like you know what i mean it could be a majority white community and they would have a very small southeast asian or a small asian Mm -hmm. population small Mm -hmm. african-american population small latino hispanic population that's true and i think with texas there there are a lot of places i i would say i you know i didn't necessarily grow up around a large hispanic population either so when i moved to new mexico Mm -hmm. it was kind of nice to that was those were different cultures that i got introduced to Yeah. I mean, I guess where I grew up, yeah, there was a larger Hispanic population. Now, where my dad was from, which is Newton, Texas, which Mm -hmm. is like, it's like three, I guess it's three hours north, which is, it's basically country. It's like, (laughs) you know, there's like a crossroad, you know, so it wasn't very big. Unfortunately, at that time, it was still, there's the black side of town and the white side of town. And that was pretty much it. Yeah. Obviously you alluded to kind of your family dyna- dynamics. Who in your, who is, I'm assuming African-American and who's, mm-hmm. who is the, the <laughs> Hispanic in your family? Well, or, no. not, or not even Hispanic. I'm no. making assumptions. Hispanic. Tell me. <laughs> Girl, that is, that's why I know Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> because my dad is African-American and my mom is Caucasian. So, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. But did you get mistaken though for okay? <laughs> I did the thing that I always clown people for doing. <laughs> I was like, I knew she's biracial. I just didn't know what the mix was. <laughs> right. No. So <laughs> growing up in Texas, I mean, people would walk up to me, start speaking <laughs> Spanish. You know, everyone assumed that you know I had a Hispanic background or Latino background, but I did not. Mm. And so (laughs) when it was time, and then my brother, he married um, a Hispanic uh, girl. Uh And so she didn't know Spanish either because her parents (laughs) used Spanish to keep secrets. So when I was with them, it was like, I remember one time being in a parking lot and we were visiting in Albuquerque and this lady, she was selling tamales, tamales, yeah. and she walks up to us and she, you know, she's like trying to sell. And we're like, just looking at her like, duh, like, I don't know, <laughs> like neither one of us understood, but of course, looking both Hispanic. And so then she gets mad and she's like, why you just no say no? And we're like, we don't know. <laughs> It's annoying when you're on the receiving end of it, but sometimes it is kind of funny because I've been in situations where, um, you know, I've had folks who are from West African communities just start talking the tribal language to me because they thought I was part of the tribe. (laughs) And I'm just like, I don't even know my, like, like, I don't even know my mom's. I I, I didn't even learn yours. And you want to be like, Wait, wait, hold wait. On. and then and then and then my favorite part of all of this is that so I was uh, yeah because I was walking with a friend she's Nigerian she's Yoruba this woman comes up starts mm-hmm. speaking Yoruba to me my friend says to her who does know Yoruba she doesn't know it because she's not even Nigerian 
this woman gets <laughs> offended that I'm not nice. That's the that's my favorite part is that it's right? not oh I made a mistake. They get people get offended that you are not what you what they thought you were, and you're trying to yes. hide and whatever. I'm like, it's not even trying to hide. I don't know. Like I'm not Nigerian, so I don't know what yeah. to tell you. <laughs> No, my, my husband is Cuban and Puerto Rican and people will start talking to me. Like when we, <laughs> when we lived in DR, right. people would start talking to me and say, yeah, I know he doesn't understand, but can you tell him <laughs> or, you know, would you do that? But, and I'm like, but why, okay. But why do they okay. assume he's not the one who understands though? Like, <laughs> I mean, cause he's lighter than me, I guess. <laughs> So I'm like, uh, okay. But even in the U.S., I mean, people just straight up, like, I was in New York in the midst of a large group of all brown people. Mm -hmm. And we were there because a friend was sick. And this lady, <laughs> she weaves her way. I'm, I'm talking about, like, 50 people, okay? <laughs> She weaves her way through the 50 people and she walks up to me and she starts talking to me in Spanish. She, she's like, do you know where the emergency room is? And you know, all these questions. And I'm like, I'm not even from New York. I have no idea. And so then it's so funny. So then of course I start asking, cause you know, I'm not, yeah. I, I do know Spanish now. So I'm like, Oh, well, let me try to find out, you know? So I start asking and, you know, the people who are from New York, they're like, oh, it's around here, da, da, da. And so then after the fact, they're like, the people that, you know, my friends that were with me and around me, they're like, why did she come to you? Because she like, thought what you were Latina. <laughs> exactly. I was like, because. I was like, it's, you, you look, you like know, <laughs> I was like, it's just, it is. It, I mean, it's not a bad thing. It's, I'm like, it's hella funny. I mean, if you, if you refuse to let it, like, I think it's hella funny when it's people who are part of that people group and they think you're part of it. It's, it's, right. it's different when someone who is not part of that people group just is like, you are da da da. And you're like, but I'm not even, and you aren't even. So I don't know why, why we're having this exactly. conversation. So exactly. So I, so I'm very curious just looking at you. What are, have you, has anyone, has anyone ever told you? what they assumed you were. So has anyone ever been like, oh, I thought you were Puerto Rican. I thought you were, you know, Mexican or. No, I mean, when I was in Texas, it, it, I don't know really what people thought. Like it was just always, they assumed that I spoke Spanish. They spoke to me, whatever. But, and, you know, as I'm going through life and mm -hmm. talking to different people, most people are like, oh, I thought you were Puerto Rican or, oh, I thought you were Dominican. I mean, in Dominican Republic, honestly, like, <laughs> right. I, I, had pe yeah. I had this lady, she was like, well, your parents. And I was like, my parents are. She was like, well, your, your abuelos, your grandparents. <laughs> she was, was going, like, no. she was going deep. <laughs> she went, look, she was like, Three. bueno. She was like, bueno, mi amor. She was like, your bisabuelos, which are your great grandparents. I'm like, like, oh, okay. So yeah, it, it's hilarious to like, me. Like here are my here's a picture of my parents. If you can find it, if you if you <laughs> and then if you were to see my parents, like my parents are just or just like southern people. They both grew up in very small towns. Mm you know, country, they love gardening, they love country music. I yeah. mean, they had no interest really in learning another language. <laughs> um, so, I mean, my mom would say tortilla. Okay. Like your mom, oh no. So oh no. <laughs> it's like, if you talk to you're like, Oh yeah, no, she doesn't. No. <laughs> she doesn't. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Shout right. out to mom though. I appreciate. She's trying, but awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that is hilarious. Yeah. I mean, you know, we were talking offline and I, you mentioned, and we'll talk about you living in the DR, but it's true. Like yeah. I can see, I can see that because when I, I was in the Dominican Republic with some friends and so it was interesting. So I have two friends who one is is fair carla frazier actually these these are all black expensive people though and so yeah. pe people keep looking at her because of her complexion they're like you're dominican mm -hmm. you're dominican you're dominican and actually her identity is she's american but her identity mm -hmm. is jamaican 
And then oh, okay. Tiffany, who is, she's with a broad in education, a broad, yeah, in, edu- in ed. You know, she's, she's, she's not that, she's lighter than me, but not like, mm-hmm. she wasn't like on Carla's spectrum. But some folks mm-hmm. were like, okay, you're almost close to <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, same co- complexion. Yeah. And then me and Ja, I think folks would be like, wait, are you Haitian? Right. Obviously, Mm because we're we're presenting Mm -hmm. as dark. And so I can definitely see looking at you. I guarantee I like I could totally see you walking down the street and everybody just be like, oh, she Dominican. She's definitely Dominican. They just be like, I don't what what what? (laughs) Like, why is she not? (laughs) I mean, but, you know, it has its benefits. Right. I mean, at least it's, you know, right. I'm, I'm not the American. And so I'm not getting upcharged when I go get my hair done. So right. it's awesome. Or my nails. Like, you know, I'm good. <laughs> <You're> good. <laughs> so, you know, you mentioned your, your, your parents are both from small towns and growing up in Texas. Did you guys, mm-hmm. as children or as young adults, did you ever travel? Did you travel domestically or did you travel internationally or anywhere? Girl... My parents never, well, my dad was in the military, so he did get on a plane. He was in Vietnam, in the Vietnam War, so he flew. But my mother, she never flew. And once my dad came back from Vietnam, he never got on a plane again. So any travel that we did was domestic, and it was driving between, we would drive between Texas and North Carolina. And then my brother was in the military as well. And he was stationed in Albuquerque. So we would drive back and forth between Albuquerque and Beaumont. And we would go to El Paso and shop. We did do that a lot. (laughs) Like, (laughs) so when I lived in New Mexico, El Paso was the big city. Right. And where did you, what city were you in? Las Cruces, New Mexico. Oh, I've been to Las, <laughs> Las Cruces. Cruces. My brother lived in Al- Alamogordo for a while right. before he left. Yeah. It used to be called Las Casas. They might still call it that yeah. now. <laughs> I, I <laughs> yeah. can see you that. You can see. <laughs> <laughs> I have love for New Mexico. I'm mean, like, it is a funky place in America and I love it. Like, I, I love the culture and the vibe. Mm-hmm. It's very, as someone who's most of their time in the U.S. has been spent on the East Coast, like going mm-hmm. through Texas, going through New Mexico is just such a different. I mean, you can say this, you know, I've been to North Carolina. It's just yeah. so different, right? Mm-hmm. It is. And to your to your point, I, you know, and I've, I've brought this up before. I think that one thing that's beautiful about the U.S. is that it's so large that mm-hmm. we always, you know, I always joke that there are like eight countries in this country. So even taking yeah. road trips as a kid, right? I mean, there's yeah. there's a difference between Texas and New Mexico, and they're next to each other. Just, but just driving across Texas, I mean, right. you go through so many different terrains. I mean, of course, being from Texas, everyone in Texas is like, this is our own country. We got it right. all. We have the terrains. We have the people. We have, you know, that's the Texan. Y'all ain't got but, no mountains, though. But anyway, <laughs> sorry. Let me look at me. But we get snow. But we get so. snow. Yeah, <laughs> right. As we saw. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, no. I mean, and you're right. I I went from, I was driving from Virginia to New Mexico. So I did get to see sort of the change over it. Not all of it, but like just even driving through, mm-hmm. I say, the straight heart of Texas. You're right. It is, it is mm-hmm. a lot. And so mm-hmm. when, so did you, you said you went to college in Texas? Yes. Okay. In Georgetown, Texas, Southwestern University. And so did you study abroad while you were there? I did. So I um, did a spring break in Wattis, which was fun. Yes. <laughs> and so that wet my palate and got my mother used to me uh, being out of the country mm-hmm. <laughs> without her. Um, and so then I studied abroad for a summer. I did a summer in Oaxaca mm-hmm. in South Me- in Southern Mexico. And that was amazing. Did you speak Spanish at that point or were you learning or did you strengthen it? So I had, I started learning Spanish in high school, loved it. Um, and so decided to make minor initially in college, but midway I was like, okay, I'm going to major in it. So that's oh, when I okay. went abroad. Gotcha. Yeah. So so I was like, okay, I can read and uh, reading and writing. I was good, but it was like understanding. Yeah. 
No, for me, it was really the understanding, like, you know, because I wasn't doing it every day. So I had to force mm-hmm. myself. So went abroad, stayed with host family, uh, you know, did summer school. And then the afternoons, basically, we had two classes in the morning. And then the afternoon was just exploring and having that opportunity to speak and practice. And so that, you know, within those couple of months, I was able to understand and, you know, I was able to start speaking more and just, I remember my uh, professor, um, shout out to Leticia, my professor, she was like, you just have to talk because (laughs) if you don't talk, you know, and make mistakes, you're never going to learn. She was like, and then you'll have a bunch of funny stories. So I'm like, <laughs> it's very true. And so, yeah, it, it was awesome. I mean, I got sick, of course. It was my first, you know, time abroad. And at first, like initially when I got sick, I was like, oh, I'm never leaving America again. <laughs> Because my stomach, you know, I had like what they called the Montezuma's Revenge, which is basically Diary. a parasite. Right, right, Girl, which causes a running stomach. My, <laughs> my stomach was moving. Like I had a toddler <laughs> trying to get out. Like it was crazy. And I I didn't eat anything but vegetables and like bread or like sweets. Like out I, I, the bakery was my friend after that. Right. And because I ate, I ate like. I think I ate like three hamburgers in three days and it was not a good idea. And so, and my host mom, she tried to tell me, she was like, I don't think you need to eat this hamburger. And she were like, but, but I was like, I want a hamburger. So I'm going to go on and eat that. And I paid for it. (laughs) And you know, you said something interesting about languages. I think when, when you're going into a new space and you're learning you're right. I think a lot of times people's reading and writing is strengthened, but there's a fear to speak, right? Especially when you're younger, right? Because you feel like, well, I feel like once you're conscious, I think with little kids, mm-hmm. they don't care, which is why it's so easy for them to kind of sponge up and absorb a language. But yeah. you know what it is? You're just like, what if I make a mistake? What if I say it wrong? And the funny part mm-hmm. is, is that people know it's not your first language. So they're actually pretty forgiving. Yeah. <laughs> I think for the most part, people are forgiving. Sometimes you run into people who maybe have had a bad day and they're like, but (laughs) for the most part, people are forgiving. But I really do appreciate the fact that, um, you know, my teacher told me that because I've told many people that after the fact, like, because I really did. I was like, I was afraid, you know, having like a perfectionist personality it was like okay I have to let loose and do this in order to get to where I want to go so um but once I did that it was you know I just advanced Mm -hmm. like completely and so you know it it was the best uh advice that I've received about learning the language really so we often have folks who are listening in who they've got school-age children college age children and this question of study abroad comes up and I and I love the fact that you just said look I had to get my mom accustomed to the idea that I was not in the country with <laughs> you're shaking your head. maybe that wasn't an easy accustomation <laughs> it took her no. a moment <laughs> and yeah. are you are you the oldest child no I'm the youngest and, so. and the other ones had not studied abroad or done no, I mean, my brother's in the military, right. but the furthest he went was we were in North Carolina. He was in Texas. So, so he was stationed and, in the States. Gotcha. Right. So, and he never, he was never stationed outside of the U.S. So, you know, he was, according to my mother, safe. But when I told her where, where I was going, she, now this was in the 90s. So <laughs> right, right. She, the home girl went and took the map, the Atlas. And counted it out, like how many miles. And she called, I remember she called me like at 2 a.m. in the morning and was like, do you know that that is 1,000 such and such miles away from me? And if something happens to you, what will I do? I was like, well, mom, you'll be fine. I was like, I'm an adult and I can take care of myself. And also, it's a country that borders the United States. (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, you have to keep in mind, yeah, you, mom. you know, age, never traveled, 
you know, wasn't about, wasn't trying to get on a plane yeah. and didn't want me to make her. Yeah. <laughs> And also, so. and also, I mean, let's be frank. I think I, I'm trying to remember. I've had a couple people who live in Mexico now. Let's be frank, mm-hmm. too. You know, media hasn't always been and isn't always kind to representing Mexico, right? And yes. and and that is not to say or to whitewash or say that there aren't problems and that there isn't, you know, there aren't criminal activity or whatever. But you right. know, as as Americans, we're fully aware that look, our country. Got some criminal activity as well, mm-hmm. but we have the luxury of of sometimes highlighting other things. So I can, I definitely understand that. I mean, and even though you're saying it's yeah. the '90s, to be fair, that that right. narrative has continued for a variety of reasons, even politically now, where people are still like, "Are you sure you want to go to?" Like, it's only now that I'm even right. seeing people really like flocking and considering Mexico in a way because you know, influencers. Mm-hmm. But you know what, and. And during that time, I didn't realize it because during that time, a lot of people, you know, like I had friends that were actually students that were studying abroad in my university that were from Mexico. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was certain areas like I had a friend who was from Mexico City and she was like, I really at this point wouldn't advise you to go there because of, you know, certain things that were going on. But she was like, you should be fine you know, everywhere else. So, you know, of course I tried to, to relay that to my mother, but once I got there again, for me, I mixed in. Right. (laughs) So they were, they were checking for you. You I mean, my friend that I hung out with, she was Filipina and we were cool. Like we were good, you know? So it, it, we, we, the rest of our classmates, you know, cause we would do group trips and stuff, right? you know, they would stand out those <laughs> with blonde hair and, you know, so they would get certain attention, but nobody paid attention to us. We were, we were good. It was like, when I, well, you know, it's like when I went to Brazil by myself and I was in Rio and there are all these state department warnings and people like are you you know they're worried about people getting robbed or whatever and i'm like Mm -hmm. they're not checking for me because contrary to popular belief i look like the local population and that was confirmed when i got there because they were just like exactly she's they were just more like why don't you speak portuguese right (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) that Mm -hmm. was their concern no they're like oh lord she done came back from america not speaking portuguese Portuguese. This guy kept insisting I was part of his family. And I was just like, but I don't, can you hear the accent is what I kept saying. I'm not, I'm not, Bra- I mean, I'm okay. I would not have a problem being Brazilian, but I'm right, not. Right, right. It's just, I'm not. So here's the ironic thing. And, and I think this is a great segue before, as we get into our break and we'll talk about this on the other side. So your mom was fearful about you going to Mexico, which bordered the state you mm-hmm. lived in. And somehow you are magically now living in Taiwan. So we're yes. going to, we're going to talk about your career journey and how you and your husband got to where you are and, and everything that has sort of followed with that. So stay with us and we'll be back after the break. All right. So if you were listening right before the break, we were looking at the irony of Kenzie <laughs> going to Mexico to study abroad and her mom being stressed out about that. And then now the fact that she is an expat and she's currently living probably as far as you can get from, from where the family is, with yes. maybe the exception of Australia and New Zealand. I don't know, but she's pretty out there. So yeah. I, you know, for for the context of the listeners, um, you know, I, I would love to talk a little bit about your career. And so you were sure. in human resources for a good bit. Is that correct? Yeah. So I was in human resources for over 16 years. And did you, is that something that you went into coming out of college or is it something you fell into? No, it was something I went into out of college. I initially, I had a um, accounting internship at Coke, actually. 
Mm. And I discovered that I didn't love numbers like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I really preferred to work more with people. So, um, when I graduated, uh, I decided to go into human resources. That was my target. And so started there and that's where I ended up. Okay. So accounting, because I have a story for mm -hmm. everything. I, <laughs> when I was getting my business degree in the back of my mind, I thought, okay, I, cause I did an MBA and I thought I will, maybe possibly focus on accounting so they'll always have a job if I need it, right? Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Like, <laughs> like I, <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking <laughs> because as a person, if you know me, I'm a big picture visionary person, but I'm not mm -hmm. a detail person. That was the most painful. Girl. It was one of the top two painful classes I've ever <laughs> taken in it, my life. <laughs> it was clear for me when my, you know, supervisor at that time, I remember she started laughing, like, at a numbers joke. <laughs> and I remember going to lunch and telling my friend, I was like, I don't think this is for me because I didn't find it funny. I was like, this is not, I was like, I'm tired of looking for numbers all day. I was like, I don't know where they are and I don't care where they are. <laughs> I was like, this is just not, no. Mm -mm. And accounting is, for those who have not had the fortune or misfortune of trying to mess around with it, like, mm -hmm. you really are getting stiff down to the penny. And, yes. I, and, and in my mind, I'm thinking, it's a penny. Like, why mm -hmm. do I need to go back and look over? But mm -hmm. I know, I know it adds up, but you're right. Like, if you got a, first of all, if you got a numbers joke, I already know where this is going. And it ain't going <laughs> Same, it's not, going look, we can't be cool. That's what I discovered. <laughs> that if you got numbers jokes, we can't be cool. Especially so. if you laughing hard at it. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was, I was like, no, no. <laughs> it's, sorry, I, I cannot get over that. Just because an, an accounting joke. Okay, whatever. Um, yes. So, so with human resources, it, it's pretty broad, right? So, yeah. in terms of there's so many things. There's everything from Obviously, there could be talent and recruitment. There could be mm -hmm. payroll. There could be benefits, compensation, mm -hmm. all of these things. Um, where where did you sort of land? Did you have your hands eventually in a lot of different areas or were there's an area that you specialized in? So I did pretty much everything. Like my, especially in my first job, um, I worked for a small startup company and I was the only HR person and I did it all, mm -hmm. um, including payroll, which going back to the accounting was not for me. Right. Um, so <laughs> going from there, I was, I was a generalist, you know, HR business partner. That was the realm that I stayed in. Um, now I did have, you know, in growing my experience, um, certain times where I was specializing a lot in benefits. Mm -hmm. Um, but still, wearing the hat, you know, of pretty much everything else. Cause you know, in human resources, you have a title, but you pretty much always are responsible for everything because fires happen. I'm an HR expert with the exception of payroll. <laughs> that is not my, payroll, right. That is not, yeah, that is not for me. Where were you doing this? Were you doing this in Texas or had you moved to a different part of the country? No. So when I graduated from college, I actually moved to North Carolina because at that time, you know, things were going really well economic wise in North Carolina. And I wanted to, uh, you know, be closer to family like that I had in North Carolina. So I decided to move there. My brother was in my brother was actually in Charlotte and I mm. ended up moving to Raleigh. And then afterwards, my parents, I think a year later, my parents moved back to North Carolina too. So. Oh my gosh. Wow. I didn't realize y'all came. <laughs> yeah. Kind of trek back here. So how. Yeah. My parents were like, my babies are there. We have to go. So. go right. And you and I were talking about your husband offline. Where did you mm -hmm. end up meeting him? Did you meet him in North Carolina or is it kind of later or earlier in the story? No. So I met him, I had been in, I guess, in North Carolina about seven years. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So we met at a party at a friend's party. Uh, a friend had a graduation party for their daughter and we, we met there. 
Yeah. And obviously it worked out. So, <laughs> so, so <laughs> after much persistence. Yes. Oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> on, on his side? Not on <laughs> my part. Not no. on your part. <laughs> Girl, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know, you know, I was like, oh, she gonna be honest. She said, no, it wasn't me. It was definitely him. Pers- yeah. <laughs> Persistency yes. and consistency. You know, if you work yes. together, you can get, you can get what you need. Exactly. <laughs> so here's, here's the, here's always the part that then I wonder often when I'm talking to expats, you've had this career, you're working in HR, you've been doing this for years. Yes. At what point did you decide that you wanted to go abroad or what is it that was the catalyst for you to go abroad? So, of course, I had had that taste of living abroad when I was in Mexico. And in all honesty, I think it started before then, because when I was little, I don't remember what age, but I remember seeing Spain on TV and I was like, I got to go there. And I and I told my mom, I was like, I, I got to go there. <laughs> and so later... 2019 when I went, she was like, Oh, I'm so excited. You're finally going. But anyway, so it, you know, it was something that I, I wanted to do. Like I just wanted to live abroad and have that different experience because, you know, growing up biracial, it, it was not always the best, especially, Mm -hmm. you know, getting certain having certain experiences living in the South. Um, So I realized when I went abroad in Mexico, I was like, okay, so nobody's asking me, what are you? This is cool. I like Mm -hmm. this. I think also being biracial just gave me that interest in, well, you know, what is everybody else doing? Like, what's their culture like? Um, In trying, you know, in living that, I would say that dual life, you know, so that's where it started. And then learning Spanish and then learning the variety within the culture and the countries. I was like, okay, where can I go? Mm -hmm. And initially I was thinking Nicaragua, but Mm -hmm. then a friend of mine who's from Nicaragua, well, her parents were from Nicaragua. She told me about snakes and I was like, (laughs) yeah, I can't go there. I was like, that's not for me. (laughs) <laughs> and so then my friend, <laughs> sorry, you slipped that in. I was like, wait, what? Yeah, because my friend, she would go. Her parents from from were from Nicaragua, and I was thinking, you know, city, I can do that. And she was like, no, actually, I found a snake in my bed in oh, the no. city, and I was like, oh, oh no. no, we're not sorry. And I'm not, no, everybody from Nicaragua. I'm not saying that you're gonna, you know. <laughs> Find but, a bunch of snakes in your bed, but that one story was enough for me. For me, right. So then my friends, they moved to DR. And so mm-hmm. I was like, okay. I was like, let me do some research on that. And I was like, okay, that's not, you know, too far away. It's an easy, you know, transition. So that was the the final location. And then at that point, I was also, I was dating my husband and he was like, you want to go where? Because he was like. <laughs> <laughs> he 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 had not been interested in leaving the United States. Oh, so, wait, that's yeah. a story. So his parents, his mom's from Cuba, came mm-hmm. to Cuba, you know, during the whole Castro yeah. takeover. And then his dad's from Puerto Rico. So his parents, you know, that was like, why would you leave America, you know, yeah. from their perspective? And so he had pretty much the, the same perspective, like, um, maybe I might move to another state, which he had. He had lived in a couple of other states and then come back to North Carolina, which is where his mother was living at the time. Okay. But, you know, he was like, I, I don't really see the need for that. And I was <laughs> like, well, again, I was like, if you want to be persistent, you don't have to be <laughs> persistent in Dominican Republic because that's where I'm going. I'm going. <laughs> so... Yeah. I was like, I really, I really want to have this experience. So that's what I'm going to do. I think that that's a very common in terms of your husband's family and even Mm -hmm. maybe his ideology at the time. It's actually really common. Like, I think we see it in study abroad with students who are first generation, right? So what you, what you get are first or second generation, you get kids who, I say kids, students, 
who their families immigrated for some places, right? And mm-hmm. it's typically, especially if they're black and brown places. Mm-hmm. And then you get students who are really interested and they want to study abroad in Africa. They want to study in Latin America. They want to mm-hmm. study in parts of Southeast Asia, where for them, for other students, it may be just, I want a broad experience. But what we're seeing with those students, it's also a heritage, like kind of mm-hmm. connection for them. And right. and the only reason I bring that up is that they definitely get parents who go, I escaped and left or, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I left all of that so that we would right. have a better life here. What right. do you mean you want to now go spend a year or six months that, in the place that I was trying to like not have you be raised in, which is why mm-hmm. I left. <laughs> That's what his mother said. She was like, why would you want to do that? She was like, no. <laughs> And, but you know, but you, but you get it though. It's like, you, yes. they, they went through a particular time right. and it, and it, I think, I think it's all of us too. If we, if we went through an experience or we've even just been somewhere, mm-hmm. that time is like a photograph in our memory. So we remember right. then, mm-hmm. but then it's like, okay, it's 30 years later. There are a lot of things that are different, right? Right. Like, like nothing else. People have smartphones. I don't know. That yeah. changes things. Like, like when I came, when I told my uncle I was moving to Taiwan and he was here during like the Vietnam time <laughs> and he was like, they don't have refrigeration there. I was like, um, it's 2016. <laughs> it's like they have high speed rails. They have a whole bunch of stuff that America doesn't have. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just funny to me. I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, that's just where our brains lie right our yeah. brains are just it wait what do you mean like i was mm-hmm. there in 1972 and they didn't have exactly. like running water and i'm like yeah well now they they worked it out it's, it's <laughs> there's advancement <laughs> all around the out. world but you know i think that's also unfortunately at times the kind of american perspective for those that i can see speak for my family in that they've grown up in one place. They stayed in one place and they like it and they're happy. And so, but their perspective is just what they know. Right. And they don't go to look to see if things have changed outside of it. Right. You know, they're, they're really not interested in it. They're like, I'm happy here. I like my life and you know, I'm going to continue on. And so I think that, um, especially in my family, that is the attitude. And so when, especially when we decided, you know, to move abroad, it was not only for my husband's family, you know, from the perspective of, Hey, I got you out of there. Um, (laughs) You didn't have to be, you know, that type of place. But my family was like, why in the world would you ever leave the like United States? Right? Yeah, like why? <laughs> it's you an, know? A, you know, and I think it's an interesting statement because I think everyone, not everyone, but I think a lot of Americans have encountered that particularly from from family or from friends or just from casual strangers who are like, why mm-hmm. would you ever want to go somewhere else? And I think mm-hmm. to your point, there's a natural curiosity that some of us have. Just right. to see, like, the world is a big place. And and granted, mm-hmm. we, you know, as Americans, we have, once again, a very large country with a lot of diverse cultures and whatnot. Right. But it's not the Dominican Republic and it's not Taiwan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Good or bad, however you see that. Right. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, for me, America is great, but it's not for everybody. You know, like for me, you know, I felt like I was going towards that American dream, but for me, it turned out to be an American nightmare. Mm. So it's like we all grow and expand in different ways. And I think some people, you know, just mature and they're good in what they find within America, but it's really not for everybody, even if you are an American. I would love for you to unpack a little bit just from your own perspective, you know, how much you're willing to share, but what, what was it less of an American dream and more on the nightmare <laughs> on that scale for you? Like, <laughs> what, what, what was happening? Was it the job? Was it the work? Yeah. Cause I find this completely fascinating, but yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, growing up, I was 
within my immediate family, my mother and father didn't go to college. Um, my brother went into the military, didn't go to college. So it was the first one, you know, mm-hmm. to go to college on uh, many of my cousins as well. I was the good kid. I got the good grades. So you get the good grades and then you get the good job. And then you go on and do what you get a house, you know, you get the nice house and you just continue in that job for ever how many years, which in my generation, that really didn't turn out to be like, you know, you get a job and stay there for 30 years. It's like, there's multiple jobs because you're looking for something. Yeah. And so, and I personally did not want to have children. So then on top of that, it's like, oh, you're supposed to have kids, but you don't want to have kids. So, you know, you get into all of that and then you find out that that good job, they really don't value you. Like if you leave Mm -hmm. tomorrow, it's okay. If you get hit by a bus, you'll get a card and they'll go and fill that job the next day or the next week. You're, mm-hmm. you're not important, yeah. but when you are there, your time is theirs. You're controlled. Like, you know, you only get an hour for lunch. You need to be at work at a certain time. You can go home at a certain time. And then the amount of time that you have left for yourself right. is super limited. Right. And then when you get, or for me, when I got married, my husband and I, our schedules were different. Like he worked, he left a lot earlier than me. And so during the week I calculated, like, I was like, we're only seeing each other like 10 hours during the week. We really, we're just married on the weekends, you know, like right. we're seeing each other as a couple on weekends. So it. It's just quality of life, that American dream, the prescription of it's awesome. It, it doesn't pan out. It's not true. You just spend your life working to make somebody else rich and they control you and you really don't get time to, you know, do the things that are important to you. And so I just was sick and tired of doing that. I enjoyed what I did as, you know, at work, human resources. I did enjoy it. Um, I find, you know, found it interesting and, you know, still do. That's why part of, you know, what I do is still connected to that. But yeah, just the quality of life I felt was, it was a nightmare and unfair. So I didn't want, I didn't want to be one of those people who waited till I was like my grandmother, you know, 62 or 65 to enjoy my life. But then who knows how much more of my life I have left. You've talked about your HR career and, and Mm -hmm. obviously, you know, going abroad. And so I think that's, that looks real nicely as we kind of dovetail in sort of what you're doing right now. And Mm so, you know, looking at, at your business, you're an entrepreneur and you are a career coach. What is really the focus with the brand that with your brand targeted fit, what you're doing there? So with targeted fit, what I do is work with women. My focus is working with women who were like me, who are frustrated and overwhelmed, unhappy, and really, you know, at some point, not really sure what you want to do. Or maybe, you know, this is not the life that I want to live, but not quite sure how to get out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I help women, you know, find that direction and find the types of positions that will help them relieve that frustration and stress and really find the quality of life that they want. Uh, And that may be, you know, moving into a remote role so that... Mm -hmm you know, you have time, you're not on the commute and, Mm -hmm. you know, having to deal with Joe Blow blowing at you (laughs) with his (laughs) crazy horn and whatever other stuff is going to happen there. Oh my God. (laughs) Right. My car insurance just went up because they're like, more people are driving now since, you know, the pandemic, the mm -hmm. rates went down. I'm just like, this is obnoxious. You guys are obnoxious. I just want that to be known. (laughs) Well, yeah. 
Well, the nice thing is if you work remotely, you right. you would get a cut because right. you're not leaving home. You're not leaving your so, house, right? <laughs> yeah. Or or also, you know, if they were if they're looking for jobs abroad as well, because that's a whole nother thing. Um, yeah. And you know, understanding the culture and and how to make that transition because. Of course, people have dreams, but they're not always reality of what things truly look like. So, you know, helping yeah. them understand that. But yeah, my goal is is to help women who were like me, who knew that there was something more and they mm -hmm. wanted a better quality of life and helping them transition and get that. And so we're both career people. And I know folks have heard me talk about career and probably other spaces, either on the platform or on the site or whatnot. And, and so career is such a big conversation because obviously if you're thinking about going abroad, people are trying to figure out, I got to finance this if they're not going as a retiree or, or have right. independent wealth somewhere. And so in the, in the COVID age that we're in, and I think mm -hmm. you just hit on it, how the rise of remote work for a lot of reasons, right? Flexibility, yeah. the fact that it just became a necessity when you couldn't have groups mm -hmm. of people together, and and now it's just exploded in the <laughs> in the U.S. Yeah, Do you, with your work, because I, I have a two part question, but it's going to really depend on how mm -hmm. you answer this. With your work, are you helping individuals? Obviously, you're helping them get their personal branding together, especially with right. applying or whatever. Are you helping people find opportunities as well? So I'm teaching them how to find them. And how to target those types of, of, of um, opportunities. opportunities. Yeah. Because what I find is, I mean, and you know this, most people just, it's like, oh, I don't like my job. Let me see what's out there. Right. You know? <laughs> um, but really helping them understand that, okay, especially in this marketplace, this is your opportunity. Like, we are rising up as employees, right. you know, it's, it's like, funny to hear the HR lady say this, but <laughs> this is, I mean, I was, you know, and that's the thing with HR that people are like, Oh, well you're HR. I'm like, I'm an employee too. Right. Okay. <laughs> I am an employee too. They so, just see you as part of the system that they don't see you as in like, People who also get paid to do their jobs there. Exactly. I'm like, my PTO is just as minimal as yours. <laughs> as yours is <laughs> so I'm just as unhappy about as... it. <laughs> so, and this yeah. Is, here's the question. I and I and because you're in career, I feel like okay, you probably might get where I'm coming with this. Mm -hmm. So. What is fascinating, right, is that American companies were seeing more and more people trying to track folks with remote work, right? Yes. What I see is some of the frustration on the other side is if you're an American out of the country, right? Yeah. Because all of a sudden, and I feel like I've tried to explain this. So correct me if I'm wrong, or at least what you've seen. Mm -hmm. I've tried to explain to folks that Yes, it's amazing where that random company that never considered remote work prior to 2020 is doing it now. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. You, you're running up against certain things if you're an American abroad because now the available number of workers has exploded, right? Exactly. So now they can get from in-house. And number two, and I, and I say this ain't the sexy part, but as someone who has a business, I get it tax purposes right where a, yeah. where a company is registered and so if they if they're going to go remote in just connecticut yeah they're going to get someone in a small town in connecticut but they're not necessarily going to look at somebody who's in you know italy because right. they don't they don't need to and their tax implications is that am i making sense with that part because i feel like yeah. i had to talk to more people about that and i didn't know if that was something you you run into or yes i have you know some clients here that I've worked with that are expats that it's like, that's, that's their, you know, concern. They're like, well, wait a minute. Why, why can I not get a job? You know, that's from anywhere. Everything is remote now, but the thing is there is more competition for us now. <laughs> right. And the thing is that legislatively states in the United States are starting to pay attention because they want to collect, you know, tax money. So, you know, there's a bit of a competition, it seems. I had a friend on my YouTube channel, and we talked about this, about 
you know, states are like, oh, okay, so we can compete for these tax dollars because now a lot of people are remote. So first of all, how can we collect from mm-hmm. these remote employees that they, their house may, their job may be in California, but now they're here, you yeah. know? So things are definitely transitioning and organizations because all of the, you know, COVID limitations are over organizations are now responsible for where those employees are and those that are not willing to, you know, make adjustments as far as having, uh, you know, workers outside of the country, because of course your location dictates, you know, employment law, um, that, you know, is a concern, unfortunately. And so (laughs) a lot of people for certain, now I would say if you're in IT, that's not really yeah, the, no, a because big deal for you. I, I, I'm, I'll call one of them. Google and Facebook got you because their their reach is, is literally global. And so you exactly. are right. I have seen people who are in IT companies and that's that's not their <laughs> concern because in At many all. ways they were the OGs of this. They've been sort of exactly. doing it anyway. So mm-hmm. that's not hard. One of my recommendations, and I don't know if you see this or agree with this, is that I've told some folks, you may actually want to look at some European companies because I do know folks who work with, they do marketing, they do design, they do communication, Mm -hmm. they do social media, they do IT for European companies where then they can kind of circumvent, you know, some of the limitations where if you get, you know, you can Mm -hmm. be remote anywhere in the U.S., but you can't be out of the country if they're looking at certain companies in the States. Right. And then I, yes, in Germany as well. Yeah. That's, yeah. Look at that. There's a nugget, free nugget. (laughs) Yeah. Germany is a a good market. Yeah. Um, But also I tell people, you know, just offer to be an independent contractor because a lot of times that resolves a lot of issues. All of the issues. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you know, we are, I think as Americans, so we are kind of programmed to, once again, you're the HR lady. So we're programmed yeah. to compensation benefit. You know what I mean? The, the, right. the, the, the stuff. And right. sometimes we don't even need the stuff, especially if you're mm-hmm. in a country, for example, that has universal health care. Right. Then you don't, you know what I mean? You don't really need mm-hmm. some of those benefits because you already have that. But that's part of my process too, as you know, a career coach, my first thing is let's evaluate why you're unhappy and what it is that you need, (laughs) you know, because yes, they have a wellness plan. They have a gym. They, you know, I don't know. They offer you this great vision plan, but you don't really (laughs) need glasses every year. Do you really need all of that? (laughs) What is it? And then where are you trying to go? Because If you can keep your salary and work as an independent contractor, you may pay a whole lot less for those health benefits that you definitely, of course, do need right. um, somewhere else. So it's really about evaluating first what your needs are as an mm-hmm. employee um, in order to decide to decide on, you know, what you really should be targeting. That's a great tip. I don't think a lot of people think about it. So I think you've already showcased what you know. (laughs) I was like, y'all need to work with her though. Um, (laughs) Targetedfit.com. Please come on down. (laughs) No, but it's because I, here's what I love about you. You like, you bring a perspective about employment because you've been Mm -hmm. on the inside and the inner workings and that, that a lot of people don't understand from the hiring mm-hmm. side and how things run and understanding employment law. And so I think having someone like you who's, and also someone who's doing it from an international perspective really helps because a lot, you're right. I mean, I run into this as a career coach all the time. Questions are once again, I'm unhappy or I want to change. Mm-hmm. And you and I both know before you even get to a new job, you got to think about what is it that you don't like? What is it that you do like? Mm-hmm. Where is it that you want to be? Right. Because right. Maybe you can't be a neurosurgeon. I mean, that's hard, but be a neurosurgeon <laughs> in like Bali, right? Maybe you're going to yeah. have to do something different. And, right. and, and, and I'm a big firmer in belief that irrespective of what you go, you have the same baggage. It's just a different time zone and a different area code. Yeah. <laughs> you're living, right? Unless you yes. unpack it. Hopefully you unpack it and put new stuff mm-hmm. in it before you leave. But if, please do yeah. therapy first. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is not a substitute for therapy. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. <laughs> but, but it's true. I think with the expat life, as much as we talk about the positives and whatnot, I have certainly met people that said, you know what, though, before you go on a tear in another country, mm-hmm. you may need to do some personal and reflective and get into that yes. deep, that deepness of what's going on with you. And make mm-hmm. sure you're in a at least a borderline healthy place and not think that this new place is going to fix you. Yes, because you don't <laughs> want to be lost and your mom is looking for you in another country. <laughs> right, right. That is so, also a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I agree. I've, you know, had those encounters with certain people and you're like, you know, I think really you just need to go back home and <laughs> rethink and, yeah. you know, do some work. And then because... You know, what you thought was making you unhappy really isn't, that's not really it. You know, going yeah. abroad is not going to solve that problem. Um, you know, you you really do. I mean, going abroad is a wonderful, wonderful experience. And there are a lot of things that you discover about yourself. You discover your limitations. You discover new talents, new interests. But you have to be honest with yourself before you leave about where you are and what really, you know, will give you fulfillment. Um, and that's not always going abroad. It might be something else. You've just listened to an episode of The Global Chatter, which is hosted by me, Amanda Bates. It is edited by Stephanie Ficcio. Don't forget to subscribe to The Global Chatter on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow us on Instagram at the global chatter or stop by Twitter and find us at global chat pod. If you have a question, want to subscribe to the newsletter or are interested in sponsoring, visit the global chatter.com. 